Hey, one and all, it's Grandmaster Josh Fido. And today I'd like to go over some candidates games. Uh, not the whole games, but specifically portions of the games. Uh, and I want to talk specifically about handling opening surprises. So, um, first of all, actually, uh, before that, I wanted to mention, you'll notice there's no more green screen behind me, which means I am done with the second part of my Chelsea Bowl course. Uh, I'm not sure when it'll be published yet, but I'm very excited about that. Um, if you want to check out my first course on avoiding beginner mistakes in the opening, uh, there's a link in the description, and it's on sale for, you know, from like when I published this, I think another four days or something. So you can get the whole course for 10 bucks. Or if you want it with videos, you basically get 60 mini video lessons, like, you know, like a normal lesson, basically it's 30 bucks. So a uh, pretty good deal. So definitely check that out. The links in the description. Uh, so I, I really like watching the candidates live actually, if I'm able to, if I don't have lessons or whatever else. Uh, one of the reasons is you really get to see it unfold. And uh, it's it's really like a very interesting thing because you can kind of test, assuming you're not watching it with a computer. And I recommend not doing that unless you're really curious or something like that. Um, or even without commentary, sometimes I do it, uh, mostly for me. Uh, and the idea is that I want to put myself in their shoes. I'm curious how they make a decision. Uh, I'm not going to pretend it's the same. I'm not sitting there looking at the board calculating like crazy all the time. It's really hard to put yourself exactly in their shoes, but you can ask what they would do. And you try to learn. And I think that people of any level can do this. Uh, what you can benefit from can be different. Uh, you might need more help to do this, but it can be a really nice challenge. If they play a move you don't expect, try to figure out why they played it, right? It doesn't mean it's good or bad. Um, and then you can always check what you think or what you do with a computer. That's always a doable thing. But I like, you know, really trying to use your brain. If you want to learn from the games and not just use it kind of as entertainment, that's a nice thing to do. Uh, but I wanted to discuss a few of the things that I was noticing, and one of them was how to handle opening surprises. So opening surprises in a tournament like this can be really scary. First of all, uh, you have, you know, all like elite GMs, and they're preparing with the strongest computers imaginable. And if they surprise you, it means that they still are playing with a computer and you are not. <laughs> now... The lucky thing for most of you is that you're not going to be dealing with this exactly. Um, you might be surprised in the opening, but you're probably not dealing with some super GM prep and all of this garbage, right? So unless you're playing some 27, like it's probably not that. Uh, you can still be dealing with computer prep, though. Anyone armed with a computer is dangerous, of course. Uh, and just in general, I wanted to talk about how to approach it when you get surprised in the opening. When your opponent plays an unexpected move in the opening, that clearly they know and you don't. Uh, it's a really difficult thing to deal with. It's one of the more tricky things, but I wanted to give you some tools on how to combat that, and it can apply at any level, really. Uh, the nice thing is just when you're when you're not at like a GM level or even like a master level, whatever, they, they tend not to be as bad because oftentimes you'll play a different move and then you'll just both be on your own and it's kind of fine, right? You're not gonna get slaughtered because someone spent like hours and hours with a computer. Luckily, you know, I won't have to deal with that almost for sure. You're not going to have to deal with that. But it's still nice to know how to deal with surprises. So I want to go, uh, the first game I'm looking at is the game um, from Fabiano against Hikaru from round one. So in this game, and if you've looked at the games, you probably already kind of know what happened. But basically, Hikaru played the movie E5 and everyone's like, what? <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be dubious. But okay, let's put yourself in there in the shoes, right? You've never seen this move before. You didn't know it was possible. And all of a sudden, your opponent plays this. Um, now, Fabiano, of course, knew some things. He's seen the move, but he probably didn't know it that closely because why? You know, you don't look at moves like this when they're considered a little wrong, right? So the first thing that you want to make sure you do is whenever you're confronted with something new, obviously in a blitz game and stuff like that, you don't have this luxury. But generally, you want to take at least a little bit of time. But I would say one of the big dangers is people take way too much time. Uh, to give you an idea, in this position, you probably don't actually have to think that long. Um, and the, the main reason I say that is because you have a fairly clear response. So one thing you always ask yourself, right, is what is the point of my opponent's move? How does it differ from the move I know? So the most direct comparison I can make to this e5 move is actually the move a6. 
because if you play like knight c6 it's kind of different right g6 you're you're kind of committing to different things to me this looks like a knight or if they just didn't put a pawn on a6 right so you always ask like, what's the main difference like why do they put a pawn on a6 right why in this position do people generally play a6 which is a slow move it gives you a whole extra tempo to play a move but they often follow it up e5 and it's very clear that it's designed to control this square so how does that affect the position well it's not knight there. If we do this, we get some kind of awful Sveshnikov, it looks like. This does not look very appetizing to us. So it's got to be bishop b5 check. And you can kind of deduce what a good move is sometimes just by logic a little bit. It doesn't always work that way. And I would say you never want to do it purely by logic. You want to always calculate. But the th key thing to calculate in a position like this is that, let's say, bishop b5 check. So there are a couple of moves that you have to calculate. Knight fd7, we can just exclude as a little too weird, right? Undeveloping a piece. There are times moves like that can be strong, but for the most part, not really. So one thing is they can play bishop d7. And here, the, what I would calculate, what I calculated during the game, was that you can capture. And then at the very least, we just go back to e2. So one thing to note is that a lot of the times, this is the problem bishop. The c8 bishop is a problem for black in the Sicilian, but I would say that trading it off when you've weakened the d5 square is not good. Uh, when there's a weak d5 square like there is here, the trade of light squared bishops without any kind of pawn structure change is usually quite bad for black. And next, for example, if they try to pressure our pawn, we can play a very nice move, bishop g5, we pin the knight to the queen, and we're very happy to have a trade like this at some point. We end castles, and a position like this should be very, very pleasant. We have the weak d5 square, nothing really to worry about we have to regroup our pieces somewhat but i mean this sh should be at least relatively safe and pleasant so this is one other thing i would say that especially if you think you're facing a computer in particular but even if it's just a move you don't know looking for positions that f that seem safe is a good idea you don't have to calculate it to death right after 92 you can more or less stop right 92 okay i'm pretty safe here not behind the development e4 is very defensible with knight g3 or even pinning the knight shouldn't have a big deal right now again you can look at moves like knight f5 there's nothing wrong with looking at moves like knight f5 there really isn't i'm not claiming this is a bad move maybe it's the best move i, I honestly don't know but what i would say is that sometimes moves like this become more complicated than they have to so when you're calculating you don't necessarily have to find the best move always a few moves down the road this is a counterintuitive thing because um, you're aiming to find the best move here, right? Uh, and I think that that's one of the most common things um, that people get wrong. One thing you want to do is simplify your goals. You're not trying to find the best move three moves from now. You're trying to find the best move now. And sometimes that means that here, you don't have to go, okay, well, I need to find the best move here. You just have to go, okay, 92, my position's fine. My position looks nice. That's it. Uh, and if you do that, you're going to make your life a lot easier. Now, once you get here, I don't think you should play 92 right away. I think you should think to see if knight f5 is better. Why not? But keep in mind that when you play bishop b5 check, the likelihood your opponent's going to play bishop d7 is not that, not even like for sure, right? If they play knight bd7, all that thinking was for nothing. So make sure you know when to stop. Knight d2, my position's okay. That's it, right? So then knight bd7 was played, and this move definitely looks trickier. And now it's a little bit harder, because knight d2, I should point out, this still looks like a safe move to me. If you're unsure, of course, you can play this move. You know it's fine. And there is an argument to be just playing a move you know is fine relatively quickly. The main perk is that you save time. Uh, and this is one of the main dangers that you have to realize. It's not just position when you face an opening surprise, it's time. If you end up using an hour to get through the opening, in an hour and a half game, that's not good. That's way too much time. So you have to simplify your tasks somewhat. But in this position, I do think playing knight f5 is a lot more secure uh, than it was previously, and, and not necessarily more secure, but I definitely think it's a very nice option. And the idea is that you're targeting this d6 pawn, and it's very hard to dislodge the knight immediately. There's no like bishop attacking the knight right away. So a move like this, I think you can play without going too crazy with calculation, I really do. So black plays a6. Now, if your opponent's still playing instantly, they could be a lunatic. <laughs> you face them all the time. Don't worry about it. So don't assume your opponent knows. Obviously, candidates facing a Karo, I'm sure he knows <laughs> what he's doing. 
Uh, although coincidentally, I do find that Hikaru, at least in the past, maybe not anymore, uh, would play like moves really fast, even if he didn't know them. But in general, that's not true. So uh, it does mean that, you know, you're, you haven't escaped prep yet, but you still have a normal position. So what Fabiano did here, I actually really like, and this is a cool approach. So uh, the most testing move, like I happen to know this position, right, is, is bishop takes d7 check, but this is the kind of move that I would calculate and say, no thanks, at least if I didn't know it, right? Because you calculate it, right? Bishop takes d7 check should be calculated first. It's the most forcey move. Now, if black takes with a knight or the bishop, for example, you can grab this pawn. This looks, of course, extremely good for white. Up a pawn with a really annoying queen. But they can take with the queen. So here, I would still calculate. Bishop g5 is a very forcing move. If black doesn't have a good move here, then this is great, right? And keep in mind, you have to calculate this in this position <laughs> uh, before you take the knight, of course. You can't wait till here. Um, but this is what I would calculate. And then the question is, like, what is there here? And one of the most important things is to make sure you see possible moves for your opponent. You don't want to stop after bishop g5 because tempo moves are not over. So you can pause if you'd like, figure out what move black would play here. That move is knight takes e4 check not check <laughs> but this is an extremely important move without knight takes e4 this would be just awful for black black's position would be just really rotten and you should absolutely do this remember not all your opponents are actually going to be playing stuff armed to the teeth where they know exactly what they're doing they could be playing some garbage you always look at this if they're playing garbage you want to refute their garbage so don't just assume that all of it's good don't assume it's bad either but the key here is that black has this move knight takes e4. So if knight takes e4, queen takes f5, this is actually quite annoying. So you can take this pawn on g7 with check. Oops, sorry. Bishop takes g7, knight takes d e4, and then the move castles. And quite honestly, I would calculate this and decide probably not for me. Not that I think this is bad for white. I should point that out. I don't think this is bad. I think it's unclear. I think that black has these bishops. Our pieces are weird. Uh, their center could start moving. They're going to get compensation. It's not a position I would deem as, okay, this is nice and secure for me. Now, you do, can't always get a secure position. That's kind of the way, the way of life. But I would say that you don't necessarily need to think in terms of, like, I have to refute their system, right? To me, this is a position that is not necessary. Right? So I would look for alternatives. It doesn't mean that I hate bishop takes d7, but I would look at that line and go, okay, kind of murky, right? I'm not really sure. And if you decide that bishop takes d7 is, is too complicated or whatever uh, you want to call it, that's also completely fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. So I think that the move bishop a4 uh, that he played is actually quite reasonable. You're basically keeping the tension, keeping the pressure. And you're basically saying, okay, well, you ha still have to solve your problems. Of course, Hikaru's idea was b5, bishop b3, knight c5. And here, once again, it's really a question of what, you know, what is possible, right? So you look at this position, and it's actually really easy in some sense, because it's like, well, I have to control this d5 square. Sorry. Uh, I can't really save my bishop or anything like that. And so it's really just, okay, bishop g5 is by far the most natural move. So you have to calculate things like knight takes e4. You have to make sure this is all, all fine for you um, and, and all of this. But I would say that for the most part, something like this is actually rather simple to play. You have superior development. You have great control over a square. So of course the idea is this and then bishop e7. Um, and again, I would say that he does another nice decision, which is he simply takes off this knight and castles. Now, you could argue maybe playing queen d5 first, other moves might be more accurate. The point is he gets castled. He has a fine position. The pawn on f5 is a bit weaker, but not indefensible. He has these light squares in the center. If black ever takes this bishop, it's like a positional disaster because you have the great knight against the bad bishop. But ultimately, he just gets a very satisfactory opening position by playing logical moves. So he was surprised, but and he did use up a fair amount of time, probably calculating a lot of the stuff we were talking about. Uh, and of course, when you're when you're playing, you see all sorts of other things uh, that you have to calculate. But I want you to notice that even though he used up some time, he got a position which is actually quite safe. So in the game, Hikaru played this, 
And I actually thought watching that that um, Fabio would just play queen b5, the idea being that uh, you can't take on b3 because of this, maybe amongst other things. Uh, queen xc4 is a check. Uh, that's the key. Right? And if you block with the queen, I take your rook, and it becomes a huge disaster. Uh, so you, you would have to castle, and then knight takes e4. This is kind of what I thought would happen. Um, but he played a different version, which is also very similar. He took first, which is kind of fancy. I saw everywhere this was given like a double x clam, which to me is funny, because it's like, okay, you can play queen d5, take the pawn. You can do this and take the pawn. It's not, uh, you know, but hey, people like brilliant moves. It's all good. Uh, but I'm sure if you ask Fabi, he'd be like, this was not a really move. It's a very normal move. Uh, because it's, it's a fairly simple tactic, right? You pin the knight. If d5, you take it. It's, you're not helping anyone. So uh, you have to just abandon the knight, which, of course, is not a big deal. And then you take on b2. But I want you to notice that the position Fabi got is very, very safe, right? He had a bit less time, but in a lot of ways, his position's a lot safer. He has the beautiful bishop. He has the target on f7, the weak d5 square. So... In the end, this opening surprise to me was not super effective for that reason, and he really handled the, the situation quite well, I think, for, for that reason. Um, incidentally, if you're preparing an opening surprise for someone, uh, I would also learn from this. Now, this isn't really the saying that he did it badly. He did get a draw here. Uh, he was in some trouble, I think, uh, or later. But you have to remember, this is one thing you don't want to copy from these guys. <laughs> this is very important. They often prepare opening surprises where they the opponent might be able to just get to a safe position, but they know they can draw it because they've looked at it. That is not how most human beings sort of approach a chess game. Uh, generally speaking, when you want a surprise, you want to think, okay, something that's hard to handle for my opponent, that they don't have a nice safe option, and that you know it'll get to some interesting position, which hopefully I know better than my opponent. In general, that's kind of the goal, right? So anything that allows your opponent to get a very safe position uh, where they're the ones pressing is generally not something I'd recommend. When you have the level of defense that these players do, it's different. But I would say that you don't want to count on that and playing two result positions, meaning positions that you can really only draw, uh, really only draw or lose, like you can't win. Uh, is generally really not desirable uh, for players, anyone other than the elite. And of course, even they don't like it. It's just, it's their professionals. They know that drawing is black is, you know, a fine result and they tailor their openings that way. Um, not always, as we're seeing, we're seeing lots of really fun openings in the tournament. But in general, for most players, that is not a good way to prepare. So it doesn't mean the C5 opening is terrible. Even if it's a bit dubious, obviously he was hoping for something sharper than this, which he knew better than Fabiano because he had looked at it more recently. But in general, this is a great example of how to handle an opening surprise. So just to recap it a little bit, he plays the most critical move, right? You don't shy, you don't just move the knight and say, okay, uh, and allow like a great knight arf where they don't have to play a6, for example. That's not really wonderful. Um, and then, you know, he basically, play again, plays a critical move, attacks the pawn, doesn't shy away too much. But here, rather than go for this crazy mess after bishop takes d7 check, he could bring the bishop back either way, but he basically decides, you know what, I'm going to put the bishop where it controls this square, I'm going to pin the knight, and he basically got a position that was very, very safe, where he controlled the center and didn't have a lot to worry about. Uh, so for the next example, I wanted to look at this game. This was between uh, uh, Lei Ting, Ting Yi and Tang Zhang Yi. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. I, I hope these players don't have to, have to hear me say that. Uh, but lay and ten, right? So this was from the women's candidates. Um, this was also round one. And in this game, the surprise that lay faced uh, was kind of a bit different. It was in a queen's gambit declined with bishop g5. And here h6. Already like a little un like a lot of the times i would say li like this in the old school you were supposed to not play h6 you're supposed to play c6 knight bd7 castles rook e8 knight f8 blah 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 um is the normal way to play before uh these days early h6 is kind of fashionable discussing the details of why this is is a lot trickier <laughs> uh i mean i'm kind of aware of it i don't want to make this an opening lesson but it's one of those things where i still see h6 and think uh, the like they don't know what they're doing which obviously they do know what they're doing it's just it's newer right because uh, it used to be h6 was considered relatively dubious uh, because you know you're opening up this diagonal but here 
pawn played um, bishop g4. And this is a move that I'm sure was surprising to lay. And the question is, how do you handle it, right? All of a sudden, your opponent attacks your queen. The normal way to play, by the way, is more, you know, something tranquilo, right? <laughs> Just here, bishop here. Maybe knight e4 is, is a reasonable option. That's one of the perks of playing h6. That is usually what you'd use with the move. Uh, but you can, of course, also castle or something. Knight g2, knight here, and life kind of goes on. Um, would be the normal thing. So bishop g4, your opponent plays an unexpected move attacking the queen. So again, how do you deal with it? So you want to look at, well, what is the purpose of this move? Uh, to me, this is a developing move. They're trying to get developed faster and with tempo. Uh, they're also trying to discourage a certain setup. So bishop d3, knight g2 is considered a very normal setup, and this move discourages it. So one very important thing is that I see a lot of amateur players, you won't see GMs do this very much, but they'll play moves like bishop e2 and just say, all right, whatever, I'll just trade off the bishop. The problem with this is that this trade is a huge success for black in these Carlsbad structures, right? I mean, the, the three pawns, uh, you know, with the pawns on light squares, trading off the, the light squared bishops is a huge success. Black doesn't mind the trade of dark squared bishops either, generally because black, you know, trades are, are generally good for black in these positions. There are exceptions to this, but... Uh, bishop trades, you know, really make the position easier to play. Uh, but I would say that there's simply no reason to do this. This would give, you know, black a huge amount of success. So I really want to move the queen. A move like f3 feels too weakening to play this early. Uh, there are occasions where f3 makes sense, and later in the game f3 might be nice, but it's very early to play a move that, that that's that potentially weakening. So I, I would really veer away from that. So then it's really a question of moving the queen where true. So there's c2 is the normal square, and b3 is what I would call the punishing square. So here's the key, and you can actually pause your video if you want and try to figure this out. Which square would you go to? Uh, I don't think it's that simple, but take a moment and try to figure that out. So the, the main thing, I guess, is that queen b3, you have to really make sure you're calculating. So queen b3 looks at first like a really great move. You're attacking these two pawns. It looks very nice. Uh, I would say that if you had already taken this knight on f6, this would actually be crushing. For example, like I, I realize taking the knight's horrible, you lose your queen. <laughs> but if you could accomplish this, it would be great because you're attacking the two pawns. If c6, queen takes b7, this is a huge disaster. The rook's trapped. If here you take, this is not going to end well. But because you're not able to do that, uh, black can actually play this move. And don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean it's bad. You're not committed. But the problem here is that, first of all, if you take this knight, I can take back with the knight. This is not so clear. Um... <laughs> Doing this uh, would lead to all sorts of disasters. Uh, <laughs> the funny one is if queen takes knight, you could take this bishop, but this is actually checkmate, which is even funnier. Uh, so this is not a good idea. Uh, taking the pawn, I also think, is a terrible idea because there's rook b8, something like this. Rook takes b2. Don't get me wrong, you're up a pawn, but this king looks horrible. The bishop might come to b4. Black will get castled and start attacking. This would be an example of... This is too dangerous. Like, there's no reason to do this, especially you're facing a well-prepared opponent. No way. Honestly, I would I would reject that pretty firmly. So, uh, Lei, I think, plays the much uh, nicer decision of playing queen c2. Uh, and her idea is basically that she's, um, you know, just putting the queen on the normal square, right? So, black plays castles. So, once again, I think it's very important to always ask yourself, what is my opponent's idea? Don't get me wrong, sometimes they do not have one, right? Uh, especially you go down amateur levels or below, right? Like a lot of the opponent doesn't have a specific idea. But you always want to, you know, try to look for their ideas anyway. So once again, you have a position where, well, can I play bishop d3 and knight d2? Or just get to some normal kind of position. This bishop on g4 is developed, quote unquote, right? But it's also on a weird square. So the key is you want to see what your opponent is up to. One thing you'll notice is they haven't played c6. They've castled and developed their bishop. So you could argue the bishop on g4 is on a bit of an odd square, but really their development is a lot better than ours. We don't want to castle queenside usually. We can't at the moment. The bishop prevents us anyway. But 
Castling Queenside is generally pretty dangerous, a uh, position like this, so we're not super anxious to do that. And so that means that our king's actually in the center and we don't have kingside pieces developed. So a move like this, I actually think would be a bit dangerous because we can, they play this move. And they're really using the fact they haven't played c6, they're putting pressure. Uh, a move like knight e2, you have to deal with moves like c4 even. And again, we don't really want to exchange these bishops. There's all sorts of things going on. Uh, they also don't have to play c4. They can continue developing and they can always take the knight sometimes. Like there's all sorts of different options, right? Uh, the point being that they have lots of pressure on the center. And if something like this, they could even play d4. And at least when I saw this, I'm thinking, no way. Not a good idea. Now, I think one of the big purposes of doing this is that you'll notice that the normal idea, right, of bishop d3, knight g2 is just worse now, right? So one of the big things when I look at openings with students and things like this, I encourage them to at least have a vague idea of what other options are. And the reason for this is let's say bishop d3, knight g2 is the only idea you know. It's the only plan you know. This is going to be a hard position because c5 is such a good move against bishop d3. And if that's the only idea you know, you're almost playing chess in a crippled fashion, right? Having flexibility is one of the, the most important things to do when you're facing opening surprises. You want to be super flexible uh, with, your, with your lines, with your ideas, uh, because if your opponent plays differently, if they play something you know and you know how to handle it, it's great. Uh, but if you don't, right, if you, if you don't have that flexibility, or, or rather if you don't know the exact position and what's going on, you really don't want to, you know, you don't want to just play on autopilot. Uh, playing on autopilot is one of the things I see really common, even among players I know who are very strong. They'll play an idea that's familiar. It's just so much easier. But here, uh, what Lei does, which is really nice, is she plays h3. So there are some tactics here, for example, after bishop h5. And this is something you'd want to calculate. White has the option of taking and playing queen f5, which is a double attack. Um, this is, you know, a nice thing to calculate. There are situations where you can also try to trap this bishop on h5, but the problem here is that this move c5 just batters you right away. And keep in mind that g4, bishop g6, you don't lose a piece or anything. You're just getting crippled with your pawns and stuff. However, with c takes d4 and checks on the e-file and all this garbage coming in, this would make me very nervous. So... I don't think that this is nearly as clear as grabbing the pawn, actually. And even the pawn grab is not that clear just because you're so far behind in development. But you took a central pawn, uh, threatening a queen trade. You should be at least doing okay. <laughs> um, probably better than okay. But it's one of those things where you want to be aware of that option. So black moves back to e6. And once again, I think that Lei chooses correctly. She puts the knight on f3. So again, bishop d3 allows c5. It's the same deal. It's not really that different. And there's just no reason to allow this move. And the nice thing with knight f3, you don't get your nice setup. But number one, with the knight on f3, this move h3 is actually quite useful because it keeps an eye on this g4 uh, square. So there's no like bishop here ever and stuff like that. Um, but just in general, it's like a fine move with the knight on f3. And also, now you cover this move. So for example, if c5 and you take, you cover this d4 square. There's no d4 push. If knight c6, you have different options, but rook d1, again, covering d4. Uh, I'm not saying your position's amazing, but it's pretty annoying for black because they don't really want to take the pawn right away with the bishop because that would like allow you to pin the knight and there's all sorts of other things. Um, but at the very least, you're going to be able to play against this iqp, this isolated pawn on d5, and you know, life is pretty good. Notice how you're still very safe. When you're playing d4 openings, one thing you have to be aware of is that sometimes you're slower to develop your king side. So a lot of d4 players don't have that sense of urgency and they can get checkmated <laughs> or have their king in trouble. So keep in mind that when you're playing a d4 opening, make sure you're always kind of having your eye on your king side development because it is slower than e4 openings. So in the game, black played knight e4. And once again, you have to be careful. At first, I was thinking, well, wait, this looks pretty good. Uh, you could, of course, play bishop d3. This is rather like a safe way to play. You're trading lots of pieces, which is definitely something black doesn't mind, but it's for sure at least playable. But knight takes e4, and the problem you have here is that if queen takes e4, black has queen b4 check. 
and now again i'm not saying it's bad it probably even isn't bad but this is very annoying having your king stuck like this the b2 pawn hanging etc etc uh, it's not really what i'd want to allow if i'm white right so you have to be calculating this right you, the main thing is that no matter how simple the position may look you don't want to be lazy with the calculation so instead she chooses knight takes e4 and the idea is that if um if pawn takes e4 uh, i believe the idea here is you can take with the queen right away uh, and the idea is that like a move like bishop bishop check is is not, not as dangerous as you would think um you have you have kind of different options on how to deal with it but the whole point is you've given up like a very important central pawn so even if i have to play a move like king d1 followed by bishop d3 right like to try to you know not checkmate but do all sorts of cool things in the center you're gonna have like a lot of different options so this check is not quite as terrifying as you might think whereas the queen coming in is a lot scarier so this was played uh, of course, b takes e4 is quite playable, right? Um, but this is this is a normal option. And then knight c5. And again, you know, just activating the pieces. So here, again, this is a more controversial thing. I might leave black with this bishop. I like the knight on f3 because it keeps my king guarded. I like having the king, like this piece, by my king. And I also know the bishop on h4 is really out of place. So it'll have to take a tempo to get back in the game. So I would consider bishop d3 or bishop e2 or something. She takes on h4, which is also fine, and plays bishop e2. This is kind of a simpler way to play, um, you know, c6. And the general drawback here is that you have to deal with moves like queen g5, uh, hitting this pawn. You don't really want to play bishop f3. That's a horrible square for the bishop. And if castles, you have to deal with this pawn. So, um, you know, rook e8, castles, and, you know, life went on. And, and in general, her position was fine. She ended up losing and getting outplayed later. Uh, but I would say that her opening position at least was quite safe and she handled the surprise very well. So again, I want you to notice what she did. She play, decides, she calculated, I'm sure, like blocks, didn't like them. Queen b3, but after knight bd7, black gets tons of compensation if you try to pawn grab. So there's no point playing queen b3 if you're not going to pawn grab. So she plays queen c2 castles and then notice she's not like attached to this bishop d3 knight e2 idea even if that's all you know right you you look for alternatives so this h3 followed by knight f3 is a different idea and different alternative uh, to make sure that c5 is under control always spotting your opponent's idea is important right wait they're doing this and they're developing faster i have to be careful of the position opening is a common thought process right make sure that you're aware of the differences between what your opponent's playing and what you'd normally see um, and don't assume what they're playing is bad. This bishop g4 move looked odd to me. I'm sure it looked odd to Lei, but it's not all that bad. It's really just kind of fine, honestly, like a lot of things are. So don't make the assumption your opponent's idea is bad. There are times it is bad. You want to make sure you're not letting them get away with garbage. Uh, and especially the lower down you go as far as level, the more garbage you're going to see. It's just the way it works. But you see plenty of garbage at master level too. So don't like ask yourself if it's you know if you think that it's really bad but a lot of the ideas are not really that bad and it's a question of just navigating the waters in the right way um make sure you're calculating even if it's a position that you think you know or is similar it's not the same and the people who make mistakes are the ones who assume the position is the same i see this mistake all the time up till master and even beyond so make sure you're coming up with different ideas make sure you're calculating the position uh, keeping an eye on lines which are unnecessarily complicated, especially if your opponent still knows what they're doing and you don't. Um, but don't, you know, shy away from any dangerous move. Don't feel like you have to just curl up and do a ball. Uh, and the other thing is to make sure your time management is on point. So what that means is that your, your time management, like you're, you're using some time to calculate and navigate but you're not using so much time that it's going to cost you horribly later so try to simplify your decision making as much as you can um, but put in the work to make sure that you're not you know just playing anything on autopilot or not taking the danger seriously anyway i hope this helps there's going to be a part two i actually prepared four games <laughs> but this video is already pretty long so you're going to get a part two on this one uh, once again if you like the videos like subscribe um, it really helps support me. It makes me want to do more of these, and uh, it's really appreciated. 
you want to check out my chessable course again it's on sale for another four days uh so really you know check out the course and uh and see if you like it it's um again it's only 10 bucks uh for the whole thing so definitely check that out it's in the description and otherwise uh stay tuned for part two which will come out pretty soon have a good one